It's very It's short, very short, short so just a couple of minutes. Couple of minutes. After which I will, which I will introduce a Professor Von der and, uh, and uh, he can begin the lecture. the lecture. Okay. Okay. Professor Malos. Hello, Professor Malos. Hi, Madam Mulun. गुड मर्निंग फ्रम इट इनसेपन In 1945, Ramanandha College, Vishnupur has remained a trailblazer in many aspects. Our college has followed the path ordered by its visionary founders continuously, from establishing itself as one of the first co-education institution for higher education in the district, thus breaking gender barriers. to creating new opportunities and endeavors to uplift the students far beyond the realm of bookish education one of the many learnings from our founders that our college has continued to uphold is that of not letting despair seize the days in the face of utmost adversity and the biggest example of that has been the way our students teachers and staffs have come together to face the challenges posed by the threat of covid-19 our newest venture in this fight against this pandemic organized primarily by the department of english this online lecture series focuses on different facets of the english language and literature both due to yesteryear's colonization to today's globalization english has taken its position as the lingua franca of the modern world through this free lecture series we hope to add our two dimes in the quest for higher knowledge of this language and the vast ocean of literature it help create and be of help to our student community before we begin i want to thank everyone who made this lecture series a reality i specially thank dr narendra ranjan malos head of the department of english and coordinator iqsc of our college i also want to thank professor shamol satra honorary minister our esteemed president 
for his continued patronage. I extend my utmost gratitude to our respected Vice Chancellor of Bakura University, Professor Devnarayan Bandopadhyay, for inspiring us by agreeing to give the inaugural lecture of this series. Without further ado, I welcome you all to Web Meet English, a national level web lecture series on English literature and language. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ghorai, uh, for your very kind address. Um, um, since Professor Bondopadhyay has already arrived, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce him uh, to all of us. Um, I would request everyone apart from myself to please mute their microphones to avoid the echo. Professor Bondobadhai is the Vice Chancellor of Bakura University, West Bengal. He is also the Secretary of the Indian Association of Scottish Studies. An eminent academician, he has been a distinguished visiting scholar and honorary adjunct senior fellow at Monash University. and a visiting research fellow at the University of South Wales. He led a research project on gerontology, working in collaboration with the University of Swansea, Wales. He has published and co-edited many scholarly books and has authored innumerable papers. He is also a creative writer and his poems have been published in different journals. Today, Professor Bondopadhyay speaks about John Milton. I invite Professor Bondopadhyay to begin his lecture. Sir, please go ahead. Uh, sir, please unmute yourself and then start. Oh, yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Please begin. Okay. okay. Um, thank you very much for kindly organizing this wonderful lecture series, which is very timely especially in the COVID world. In this COVID era, we have been looking for such online lectures, online presentations, online classrooms and all that. So this is a very wonderful initiative. And I congratulate the principal of Ramananda College. I also um, thank the members of the Department of English of Raman and the College for kindly organizing this lecture series. To talk about my area, my subject that I will shortly be dealing with, um, it's a really a vast subject, a challenging subject. And uh, I believe that to study Milton is also to study the socio-political situations prevalent at the time. So that's why when we talk about Milton, when we talk about Paradise Lost, when we talk about his other poems like Samson Agonistus, Paradise Regained, Comus, etc., Lycidas, Il Pensereso, we always consider Milton 
as a poet. But Milton's personality is a is split into two different aspects. On the one hand, there is the political. On the other hand, there is the poetical. So it is sometimes very, very difficult to come to terms with these two standpoints of the poet, the political standpoint and the poetical standpoint. It is therefore, to begin with, it is therefore necessary to know extensively about the socio-political situation of that time. Milton is a unique poet who experienced three monarchs, the governance of three monarchs, James I, Charles I, and before that, sorry, James I, Charles I, and yes, Oliver Cromwell, briefly Richard Cromwell, and then Charles II. So this actually leads us to properly think about the socio-political situation of the time. And I will try to, very briefly, it's a very vast subject, but I will try to very briefly focus on the changes, on the governing situations of the time frame where Milton is present. He was born in 1608, we know. So therefore, let us try to think about the changes that were taking place at that time. Um, first of all, I would say that Milton actually was passing through an age of turbulence. And there had been different kinds of changes. We know that the first definitive change was the was the opposition to the governing systems of philosophy. The axiomatic medieval scholastic philosophy canvassed by St. Augustine or the English philosopher Ramus, and they were gradually being replaced by new cultural and philosophical formations. And this transformation was, in fact, a gradual rejection of the earlier medieval epistemic authority. So uh, nothing will be taken for granted. Up to the Elizabethan period, or up to the middle of the Elizabethan period, we find that there had been always an acceptance, a complete acceptance of the axiomatic abstraction enshrined in scholastic philosophy. But we gradually find that there had been questions. We'll come to that. Another major change had been the change from the Tudor to Stuart dynasty. After Queen Elizabeth died in 1603, James VI of Scotland and Wales became the King of England and the King of Scotland as James I, thus conceptualizing very distinctively the idea of Great Britain for the first time. But the Stuart court actually was marked by a distinctive change under James I. James, for instance, James' support to his favorites in terms of showering on them gifts, titles, honors was well known. And all at the cost of the public exchequer. He was doing this. Let me give you one or two instances. There was someone who actually joined James I as his personal page, and his name was Robert Carr, C-A-R-R, -R, Robert Carr. And as James I liked him so much, he became the Viscount of Rochester in 1611. 
and then all of Rochester in 1613. And then after this, Carl was, Carl was Robert Carr was replaced by George Villiers, who later became the Duke of Buckingham. At the same time, the Queen, the Queen's taste for excessive expenditure on luxury and lavish entertainment was well known. This naturally brought about a distinctive change from the earlier dignity and gravity of the Elizabethan court. There is a gradual, gradual shift from the earlier grandeur, from the earlier dignity of the Elizabethan court. This excessive irregularity in expenditure definitely told on the economic progress of the country. But when we come to Charles I, we find that he wanted to somehow restrict this kind of inordinate excess. He wanted to bring about a sense of moderation and balance. Now, on its religious side, this is the third change. England's attempt to remove papal sovereignty. So it actually started from the time of Henry VIII especially through the act of restraint of appeals passed by the parliament in 1553. What is this? Removal of papal sovereignty. It's actually a refusal to show allegiance to Roman Catholicism, Roman Catholic Church. This was further strengthened by especially the Archbishop of Canterbury. Archbishop of Canterbury actually used to play a very, very important role. The Bishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury was particularly functional. He had uh, as many as four distinctive functions. Number one, he would ab abolish papal supremacy. Number two, there should be public proclamation on the nature of the English church and the the Archbishop should encourage the English language Bible and the destruction of hundreds of Catholic monasteries. James I was not an exception to this. He very definitely tried to stand against the opposition to episcopal, stand against the episcopal polity. What is this episcopal polity? That means church governance by the bishops. This was actually a threat to the monarchy because the monarchy wanted to set itself above the church governance. So that's why if they accept the authority of the episcopal governance, then where does monarchy stand? So this is how a kind of growing disturbance was underway. The Reformed Church was in favor of establishing a strictly Presbyterian system. That means a church governance led by the bishops, which was very popular in Scotland. The Reformed Church of Scotland sought to dismantle the hierarchical form of church governance. But James considered the hierarchical church, constitu constituting of bishops and dioceses, as mutually inclined to sustenance of monarchy. So there was a settlement. And moreover, there was a gunpowder gun plot, uh, which, you know, took place in 1605. Um, and uh, that created a huge uproar. And there was an open announcement that the gunpowder plot was, was actually a trap for the destruction of monarchy. And uh, it was also held that the Catholic Church was behind this. So there had been, again, another form of disturbance. Let me just uh, refer to another point. So from the, we find that this kind of, this kind of disturbance, controversy was going on throughout the reign of James I. But from the very beginning of Charles I's reign, severe problems and issues began to loom large in the horizon. 
there were as many as five distinctive problems during the reign of Charles the First. Number one, the decline of economy. Number two, the falling scale of trade and fiscal policy, the taxations, the disastrous outbreak of plague, the continuing price rise and conflicting relationship with the parliament. So there have been many, many such I mean, problems coming up, especially the expenditure of the king. The expenditure, the, actually the debate developed between the, the debate that developed between the church and the parliament, uh, sorry, between the king and the parliament was initiated by Charles I's forced loans to the amount of 2,060,000 uh, 2, as collection of loans. And he did this without the approval of the parliament. And this escalated the growing sense of anger and dismay among the people. The king's indiscriminate use of his powers raised controversies and the commons proposed to cut down the tonnage and poundage. These were the customs. And uh, this was granted to the king from medieval times. But the House of Commons for the first time cut down the tonnage and poundage system. This further aggravated the situation. The contentious relation between the House of Commons and the King reached such a height that Charles I even imprisoned some members of the Commons. In the session of the Parliament of 1628-29, the Commons announced the Petition of Rights. In 1629, they published the Petition of Rights, thereby trying to stabilize the powers of the Parliament, but to no effect. Moreover, the war with France and Spain proved fortuitous. The Duke of Buckingham, who led the attack, was a dismal failure, and there was an open public resentment. After the assassination of Buckingham in 1628, the king became sad and aggrieved, while the public had been rejoicing at Buckingham's assassination. In the wake of this escalating confrontation between the king and the parliament, Charles finally dismissed the parliament in 1629 and continued his personal rule for the next 11 years. This was unprecedented. But Charles of France should not necessarily be imaged as the always in the negative light. He also was trying to do certain things which were very important. Number one, this was the king, as here was the king who always used to personally read all official papers and documents before arriving at a decision. Um, Pauline Greg wrote a book called History of Charles I. There she says, on the basis of the documents that she had examined, she says, he would sign a wide range of documents of varying importance which came to him from his Secretary of State alone. He was sufficiently conscientious to read them all and many times attended them in his own fine, spidery handwriting and sufficiently punctilious to dispense with the sign manual and manually and actually to write his name on each of those papers that he approved. This shows that he was very, very punctual in reading out all the documents. And he also wanted to continue the policy reforms and try to take very appropriate measures. I'm not going into all the details because that will take much of our time before we come to Milton. Um, in 1634, um, he took some fortuitous measures. Number one, he levied ship money tax. It was a medieval form of tax that used to be collected by the king from medieval times. It actually fomented a revolt among the taxpayers. And then very importantly, the appointment
descendant of William Laud as the new Archbishop of Canterbury. I've just told you some moments back that the Archbishop of Canterbury used to play a very, very important role in church governance and they had the power also to impact on the systems of monarchy. So the position of the Archbishop of Canterbury was very, very important and William Laud was appointed to that position. But Laud's L-A-U-D, Laud, William Laud, William Laud's religious practice was apparently anti-Calvinistic and he also tried to propagate and stabilize Arminianism, another form of the another sect of Christianity. The critics of Laud began to be openly flogged. I remember that there was a um, schoolmaster in Westminster School. He openly criticized William Laud's decisions. And that master of Westminster School was openly flogged in front of his peoples for making disparaging remarks. So therefore, in this way, um, Laud's importance in the governance of Charles, Charles I's monarchical system actually went against the people's sentiments. And there had been also a deep grievance gradually breaking up among the Scots. Number one, after becoming the king, Charles I never really decided to visit Scotland at least once. And long after he went to visit Scotland in 1633, and very briefly, and there was a distinctive clamor that the king has come here to take away the, the land that was given to the Scottish nobility free of cost. And at the same time that the king had come to make the Scottish prayer book compatible with the English Book of Common Prayer, thereby trying to destroy the distinctive identity of the Scots. As a result, in 1640, the Scots invaded England. It's in this way that the king, in fact, was particularly functional in organizing a Puritan movement against himself. And this movement was joined by people of all kinds, people from all kinds of social strata. This, this was further conjoined with the opposition of Charles's implementation of Ship Money, Ship Money Act in 1640 without the approval of the parliament. And it was meant to be meant to fund the expenses of personal expenses of Charles of Ars as they had developed increasingly disputes, the king in 1637 obtained the ruling that the king should enjoy absolute authority in implementing taxes. The parliament was reopened in 1640. All members assembled and submitted their grievances relating to religion, liberty of the parliament, and the protection of property it led to continuous disputes and contentions, and Charles once again dissolved the parliament, and finally he strengthened a rebellion against monarchy that led to the Civil War. The Civil War led to the exhibition of Charles I and the formation of the Puritan Commonwealth under the Lord Protected Ship, held by Oliver Cromwell till his death in 1658, and later, briefly, by his son, Richard Cromwell. But this period of interregnum gradually began to be shown of the high hopes and enthusiasm that it portrayed. Gradually, it began to be questioned because no appropriate administrative procedure was formed. 
and no lasting legislation was passed by the parliament. It is true that the victories against the Scots, the Dutch and the Irish helped it to emerge as a significant military power, but regicide conduced to hostility among the European powers. So therefore, we can see that during these two games, there have been a distinctive disturbance and turbulence. And Milton grew up to experience such turbulences. After Charles I's second return, we find that it is called the Restoration Period. Why Restoration? Number one, politically speaking, it was a restoration of monarchy. Number two, culturally speaking, it was a restoration of theater houses and dramatic activity, which were shut down under the Puritan rule. Number three, it was a restoration of stability, balance, and order after a prolonged phase of disorder and turmoil. Actually, I will, in the next se uh, section, I will just talk about very briefly about the new philosophy and science. Um, actually, this particular period, is, despite such political and religious turmoils, is marked by the beginning of new philosophy and new science. If there had been no such ushering in of new philosophy and new science, there would have been no metaphysicals. There would have been no experimentations in the hands of Dryden and many others. Actually, it was a, as I said in the very beginning of this lecture, that there was a complete rejection of the absolute axiomatic authority of the principles of scholasticism. It is here that we find that there is a spirit of questioning. That's why this is the early modern period, which is regarded as Bikinater Nobi Temporis, the herald of the new time. And it is the time which the French philosopher said, that, uh, I mean, uh, identified as La Recherche de la Verite, the search for the truth. So that's why it is in this period that we find that from the very beginning there had been, I mean, different kinds of, I mean, controversies. There had been encouragement given to scientific experiment. For instance, Bacon, in his advancement of learning, began to challenge Aristotelianism. The long-standing citadel of authority and stresses the importance of judgment. That's why in advancement of learning, he says, Oportet edoptum judicare, meaning should be taught to judge should be taught to judge rather than operated became them created to be taught to believe we should not be taught to believe we should be taught to judge this is a very important statement that was made by Bacon in his advancement of learning ushering in the age of new philosophy and scientific experiment for instance galileo also in his very famous book il sadiatore which was published in 1623 he points out that the book of nature is composed in the language of mathematics, departing from the organic, teleological, absolute, absolutist concept of the universe. He considered, he wanted to interpret the ordered universe by means of reason, mathematics, and mechanical study of matter. And this mathematization of natural phenomena culminated in Newton's Principia, published 1687, and Optics, 1704. A similar explanatory model of nature was formulated by Descartes, the French philosopher, in his very famous book, Traite du Monde et de la Lumière, The Light of the World, in which it explains the physics of light and motion. This is how we find that there was a rejection. There was a rejection of the absolutist sense of order, the idea of the Concordia discourse, so wonderfully 
are held by the Elizabethans. But here is the first time that we find that nature comes to be, I mean, uh, comes to be uh, analyzed and observed in terms of experimentations, different kinds of experimentations. I'm not going into those details because that will take much of my time. But at the same time, this is the period which created a new intellectual climate, a very new intellectual climate. Um, I can refer to the Czech scholar Comenius, who visited the city of London um, at the, in 1641. He was talking about the prevalent situation in London. London. He praised the cultivated society, the rise of the reading public, and the intellectual climate of England. And it has been pointed out by critics that Comenius' plan to establish a universal college. Comenius actually wrote a book called Via Lucis, The Way of Light, where he wanted to establish a universal college. And this perhaps led to the formation of the famous Royal Society of London. The reading public, constituted of heterogeneous categories, began to grow extensively. And different critics have discussed the nature of the reading public in different ways. But I'm not going into those details. I'm just talking about, I'm also, I'm just referring to some of the intellectual circles which are very famous. For instance, the tribe of Ben, that means the people surrounding Ben Johnson. And then, now forgotten, a famous man, Sir Henry Oton, his circle, the circle of Sir Henry Oton, the circle of the Middle Temple, and the circle of the Great Two Circle, this is called the Lawyer's Circle, which actually uh, began to discuss various philosophical, religious, intellectual debates of the time. So it is in this way we, we find the, cult, the emergence of the cultivated middle class leadership. Um, it is in this way that we actually come to the almost the end of the first phase. I'm not going into all the details, uh, but I will now uh, just refer to uh, some of the, I mean, important points. Actually, uh, I would refer to two very important uh, conceptual aspects. Number one is nature, and number two is wheat. Now, what is nature? Previously, in the Elizabethan system of thought, nature is considered to be a Concordia discourse. Everything may have a plenitude, a variety, but all is one. It, it is unum pluribus. It is one in many, the many into one. That was the system. But in the scientific order, which is gradually emerging in the 17th century, and which Milton is experiencing, uh, shows that shows that nature is a perfect order. That's why in the 17th century philosophical thought, at the macrocosmic level, at the macrocosmic level, a similar perfection which is embodied by nature as order. Nature here means, you must remember that nature doesn't mean, doesn't refer to the plants and the trees and the lakes and the rivers, no. Nature is highly loaded, is a highly loaded philosophical term. As it is in the 16th century, so also in the 17th, as also in the 18th century. So nature actually is a, is a, preconceived sense of order. That's why he, the 17th century philosophers, uh, philosophers think that at the macrocosmic level, a sense of perfection is immanent in the planetary systems, the movement of the planets, the cycle of seasons, or the cycle of day and night. If you have read Milton's Paradise Lost Book 4, there you will see that Eve is asking Adam about the planets, the stars. Why are there these stars and the planets? 
giving us light. Why is there the moon? He is asking these questions to Adam. Adam says that that is the perfection. That is the macrocosmic perfection, he means. That is the sense of perfection. They move according to an order. And we have also to imitate that sense of order in order to be perfect. So nature is perfection. Nature is harmony. Nature is balance. Nature is order. And at the, this is at the macrocosmic level. <coughs> at the microcosmic level, the world of human reality should also try to be compatible with that sense of order and perfection. So it is in this way that I will just uh, um, I'll just cut down some of my points. Uh, in fact, very briefly, I must say that the Elizabethan uh, uh, school of criticism had been very, very much Italian. Um, but the uh, but the 17th century philosophical system is basically uh, adherent to the French critical tradition. Uh, and this is very definitely found in the French critics who began to exert a great influence on the 17th century writers, including Milton. For instance, Boileau wrote his book, La Art Poetique, The Art of Poetics. Le Bossu wrote the book, The Poem Epic, The Epic Poem. Raffin, Reflections to La Poetique d'Aristotle, meaning the reflections on the poetics of Aristotle. Then Cornell examines, examination, discourse, discourse, etc. The 17th century literary theory came to be largely influenced by similar critical and uh, ideals enshrined also in a specific Dutch critical theorist called Daniel Hensius. We must remember this man. He actually uh, had a very great influence on the 17th century writers, especially in the domain of dramatic craftsmanship. His book, Du Tragica Constitutione, which means The Craft of Tragedy, it was published in 1611 and it exerted a great influence on the 17th century writers. So after this uh, brief view, I can talk about this for hours, but I'll have to also talk about another very critical, important critical dictum, which is wit or ingenue. Wit is regarded as objective speech. I, let me quote some lines from Dryden. Dryden writes in his epilogue to Conquest of Granada. It is published in 1672. He celebrates the age of wit. Wit is now arrived to a more high degree. Our native language more refined and free. Our ladies and our men now speak more wit in conversation than those poets read. Even before that, in advancement of learning, Bacon also praised the element of wit. It is objective speech. It is, it is intelligent speech. It is the inventio. So it is in this way we find different kinds of, I mean, ideals coming up. And uh, now I will skip this discussion. I'll end this discussion because I believe that you have been able to gather some ideas regarding the socio-political reality of the time. We have seen the time of James the First and James the First sense of luxury and entertainment, so to his wives, and that actually created a huge pressure on economy. Economy actually began to decline, and it also brought down a debasement and decline in the uh, decline as compared to the Elizabethan time of dignity and splendor. And then comes Charles I. We find that a team kinds of kind of controversy began to develop between the church and the parliament. Uh, sorry, between the monarchy and the parliament, and uh, also the role of the Archbishop of Canterbury, very repressive kind of role uh, played by William Lord, and also the annoyance uh, generated among the Scots. Uh, so as a result of that, uh, he also closed down the parliament for a long, long time. Uh, and then ultimately the rebellion and the revolt and the Puritan government. Then we find that 
Oliver Cromwell comes to the uh, comes to emerge as the Lord Protectorate, and very briefly his son later after him, uh, Richard Cromwell. So it is in this way that we find that it's an age of turbulence. It's an age of turbulence, and very surprisingly, Milton did grow, grew up to see all this. But consider the intellectual climate. That's absolutely different. It has it seems it has as if no relation with such controversies, turbulences. Uh, I mean, growing up in this in the country. So this actually creates a kind of tension. How is it that the same people are emerging? are taking part so vehemently in different kinds of rebellions, revolts, all kinds of disturbances, be it religious, be it political, be it social. But at the same time, there are people who are trying to bring about the age of new philosophy, new science through observation and experiment starting in the later years of Bacon till, I mean, Newton and many others following him. So it is in this way we find that a new conceptualization of nature comes up. Nature is ordered at the macrocosmic level. Consider the planetary system, the movements of the planets. Consider the cycle of day and night. The sun rises and the sun sets. The moon rises and the moon sets at a particular appointed time. So there is order, immanent in nature. And that sense of nature, that sense of order should be put forward in the social system of thought. So you can see that where we find turbulence in the political, I mean, and religious uh, layers, we find a different picture when you consider the new philosophy and the new science. The two are extremely opposed to each other. And Milton grew up to see such oppositions. And I will now end that long lecture. Uh, now I come to John Milton. And now, if if I look at it, if I if I look at John Milton, um, I uh, try to I try to divide his life in four distinctive aspects. Number one. I consider the formative years. I'm not interested in the details when he was born, where he was born, who were his brothers and sisters, etc. I'm not interested in that. That can be found in any kind of history book. But I'm interested in the formation of the poet, the formation of the writer, and the changes and the transformations in the writer. So in the first place, I talk about the formative years. And then secondly, I talk about the brief Horton period and the Italian journey. And in the third phase, I talk about the political Milton, which completely separates itself from its political identity. And finally, I come back to the political Milton. So it is in this way that I will try to look at uh, Milton. And let me, very, let me be very brief, because I find that it is almost an hour. Uh, well, so formative years, it begins with 1608 and ends with 1632. 1608, he was born in London, and his father also was called John Milton, the same name. Now, the first, in this formative years, the first influence, I must consider the influences on the poet. The first influence was his father. Um, Gordon Campbell has written a biography of John Milton. Here, he recognizes the impact of the household in, it, in, which, in, his, in which musical performance has been a great creative occupation. So music, the love for music, the test for music. God, George Campbell comments his skills as a singer in concerts and as a player of the organ and the bass where vowel were acquired as a child in Bread Street from his father. And Milton later, when he was uh, spending his time in a village called uh, Horton, wrote 
a Latin poem, which is titled Ad Patrene, meaning to my father, to father, Ad Patrene, to father. Here, um, actually he pays a handsome tribute to his father. I am giving you the translation of that poem. It was written in Latin. But as for you, my dear father, since I cannot repay your gracious gifts to me, nor begin recompense with my deeds of mine, let it be sufficient that I remember and with great thankfulness count over in a faithful mind each one of your many kindnesses. Actually, it has been said that Milton's father was a great music. Milton's father was a great musician and uh, he himself wrote some compositions and uh, it has been also suggested that Milton's poems and some other poems were largely influenced by the sense of music that he had derived from his own father. And then the second influence, his teachers at St. Paul's School, where he was admitted in 1620 especially his private tutor, Thomas Young. He was a Scottish Presbyterian schoolmaster, but he had a great influence on the poet, in as much as he inspired him in his passion for different kinds of puritanical ideals, which will let him play a very, play a very important role in his political life, at the same time, writing in Greek and Latin. Moreover, the headmaster of the school, St. Paul School. Moreover, the headmaster of the school was Alexander Gill, and he wrote at the time a very famous book of English grammar, and he encouraged the poet to study Greek, Latin, Hebrew classics, and theology. And I should also remember, uh, I should also, also mention the founder of the school, John Collette. John Collette at, the, at that time was a very famous man. He was the one who began to teach Greek and Latin publicly. As you know that in medieval times, teaching of Greek and Latin exercises in Greek and Latin were banned by the medieval church. But John Collette, a true Renaissance man, began to teach Greek and Latin publicly. He was a very famous Renaissance humanist. So in his school that he had founded, St. Paul School, he prescribed the study of early Christian writers and he also wanted to encourage the study of classics. Thirdly, we should consider also the influence of some of his very close friends. One was the son of the headmaster, Alexander Gill, his young Gill, and another is his close friend, Carlos Diodati. His father was an Italian, mother was an English lady. Carlos Diodati, who died very early. However, Carlos Diodati and young Hill had a very tremendous influence on him. And during this time, he again and again uh, wanted to emerge as a poet. But the only poem that he had written, apart from some sonnets, uh, that is on the date of a fair infant. And he left the school in 1625, joined Christchurch College, Cambridge, took his BA in 1629, took his MA in 1632. But then we enter the second phase of his career. The Horton period, H-O-R-T-O-N. Horton actually is the name of a very laid back village. Uh, away from London. Now, after he took his MA in 1632, his father, also of the same name, John Milton, Elder Milton, I would say, Elder Milton decided to give away his business as a scrivener to his sons and retire. So that's why he had chosen a quiet countryside that is Horton, and he decided to stay there. Now, Milton also had different kinds of career possibilities. First of all, he could join the family business, but he hated it. 
and then secondly he could take up orders in the christian church and be part of the cambridge um, uh, university but he declined that idea also uh, the offer also and rather he wanted to write a magnum opus magnum great opus work a great work what is that great work a great poem he is writing at that time to carlos diodati again and again that he wants to he is maturing time is flying out and still he does know how to write that great poem that he dreams of so that's why he decided to accompany his father and stay with him in hotel and during this uh, brief time he began to study extensively the great classics the neoplatonists the jewish rabbinical writings natural philosophy music astronomy italian literature and so on so you can see he that he was a very great reader i remember dr johnson um, when he writes a life of milton says that milton's father specially appointed a maid to stay outside milton's room because he was an avid reader and he would read till midnight by candlelight right so that's why i he also later on said that it's because of this perhaps that i lost my eyesight uh whatever that may be but during this hot and period he wrote some minor poems but very important poems for instance lycidas il penseroso l'allegro comas and arcades so these are some of the poems that he had composed and he here composed a sonnet also and in this sonnet he laments that he is anxious he is getting anxious with the swift passage of time but he cannot really collect himself to that to write a great poem and he says my hasting days fly on with full career but my legs spring no bud or blossom shiveth so in this way he spent some time here and uh, he stayed here for 6 years from 1632 to 1638 and then in 1638 as was the fashion of the day to enrich himself he undertook his italian journey and in 1638 uh, he started for italy all not really take much time here he continued his italian journey for 15 months he visited paris nice genoa pisa and finally arrived in florence and met many many different people for instance he met um, and he describes them in his defensio secunda uh, which was published in 1654 uh that is antonio malasse malatesti benedetto bonametti vincenzo galilei he was the illegitimate son of galileo and he was functional in taking milton to meet galileo himself and then after that he uh, came to siena rome and naples and in rome he met giovanni stazzili then lucas holste the cardinal francesco francesco barberini and many others especially giovanni battista manzo for whom he wrote a poem and uh, just around that time he came to know about the unrest the civil war raging in england and milton immediately considered it to be his bounden duty to return to england especially in view of the turmoil and he um writes in defensio secunda after i received the sad tidings of civil war from england i thought it base that i should travel abroad at my ease for the cultivation of my mind while my fellow citizens at home were fighting for liberty so why just consider the word that he is using fighting for liberty 
So they are fighting for liberty and I am wasting my time journeying through Italy. So he considered it based and decided to come back and he came back. But after coming back, we miss the poet Milton. It's a new kind of Milton that emerges, the political Milton. The idea of writing the Magna Mapus, the great work, the great poem, disappears completely. Here we find the emergence of a new kind of Milton, and that is the political Milton. And after coming back to London, he uh, played the role of a sort of a teacher, uh, teaching his nephews and other young learners. But very soon, he began to, I mean, take up, uh, engage himself, sorry, engage himself, uh, uh, himself with different socio-political and religious aspects. He began to uh, engage himself with five major areas of activity, religion, monarchy, puritanism, education, divorce, and the last three, last one, especially divorce, having been caused by uh, his sad experience arising out of his marriage with Mary, Mary Powell. Uh, during this time, uh, he took upon himself uh, the task of joining the anti-episcopal debate. That means the church governance. Right. So that's why he, during this time, wrote a number of uh, pamphlets. The most important thing of reformation touching church discipline in England in 1641. He also began to write about education and he wrote Tractate of Education in 1644. And then he also wrote on divorce, the doctrine and discipline of divorce in 1643. And when, and this was very largely criticized, his tract on uh, divorce, very largely criticized and um, Milton's uh, uh, a particular pamphlet was considered to be uh, generated by personal feelings and that's why it was not actually, um, it was not taken kindly by um, the parliament. Even. And uh, as a result of this, uh, the parliament recommended legal control of unlicensed publication of books in 1641. And this led Milton to publish his famous Ariovagitica in 1644. This is written in the form of Isocratic Oratory. What is Isocratic Oratory? Isocrates, Isocrates was a famous rhetorician and speaker um, and was a contemporary of Plato and he used to teach the contemporary Athenian statesman the art of oratory. And he had a very special kind of oratorical art and Milton is imitating that oratorial art here in Areopagitica and he criticized the Star Chamber's attempt to suppress the freedom of expression. And at the, at the same time, all over Europe, <clears throat> there was a strong criticism against uh, the regicide. Because you still rem you remember that uh, the divine rights of the king was still recognized in that kind of world order. And as a result of that, all over Europe, there was a very distinctive controversy regarding the regicide in England. And therefore, Milton, uh, uh, Milton was responding to a book written at that time, Icon Basilica. That means the image of the king. And it was published, written by John Gowden. And it became immensely popular. So Milton decided to respond to this. And uh, he uh, wrote in 1651, Po Popilo Anglicano 
defensio. And then after this, followed by this, in 1654, defensio secunda, the second defense. Well, popular Anglicano defense, uh, the people of England's defense, and the other defensio secunda, the second defense. And while he was writing defensio secunda, he began to complain of the gradually falling eyesight. And uh, this was actually going to be gradually very, um, a very, un, uh, very unacceptable time because uh, many, well, Mary Powell um, later on came back to him and they were living together and Mary died. Suddenly he was left alone, he was blind and uh, he also had to move from his official residence of Whitehall in 1652. It was actually a terrible time coming up for him, gradually and gradually. A libelous and personal attack was published against his anti-royalistic cause, because he was anti-monarchical. So that's why a libelous personal attack was published. This was followed by attacks and counter-attacks. During this, and uh, things were rapidly changing, as you know that, uh, and Charles of Paz II came back the restoration came and Milton felt that the restoration had been inevitable and the spit for witch hunting started. Milton had to even go underground to escape arrest and execution. After the restoration, Milton even went into hiding. All the books published by Milton were burned at Old Bailey. Moreover, he escaped death sentence. However, he escaped death, death sentence through the act of free and general pardon, indemnity and oblivion passed in 1660. But it has been suggested by many critics that he was saved by the intervention of his follower, Andrew Marvel. Andrew Marvel actually was gradually becoming important in the changed political situation. And it has been suggested that perhaps he was instrumental in getting this escape from law. However, what a time <clears throat> to begin a political career, and he started his political career. Now, if Milton had died, he would still be recorded as a poet in the books of history of literature, but he would be a minor poet who has composed some poems of merit, like L'Allegro, Il Pensereso, Comas, etc. And, and a writer of many political and religious and educational pamphlets that would have been his contribution. But at the very end of his career, when not, no one can begin anything and remember that his wife has died, but he later married to, twice. However, so his wife died, he was left alone, he was being, I mean, pursued by the royalists. And this was the time that he had chosen to write his poem. So sometimes the question comes up, why? Why at all during this time that he would be able to write a poem when he cannot see? when he has to dictate, and he doesn't know how it will go, but he starts his new kind of career. Um, well, he started his plan of writing, Paradise Lost, in 1658, and completed in 1663. He, at first, prepared the drops of tragedy on the theme of Paradise Lost, around 1640, and this is very well known. Um, and these copies are preserved in the manuscript division of Trinity College. And there have been, of course, many inter interruptions. And then he finally completed the poem in 1663. And he continued to revise the poem for the next two years. Then that means up to 1665. He revised them 
and finally published in 1667. And then he also published Paradise and Samson Agonistes together in 1671. Now, I would like to, while trying to begin an assessment of Paradise Lost, I must begin the schools of criticism first. I begin with them, the schools of criticism. What are the dominant schools of criticism and what are their theoretical standpoints? I can see multiple forms of multiple forms of I mean criticism. Um, there were critics, the new critics who considered that Milton cannot be compatible with the tradition of new criticism, so he cannot be acceptable. And T.S. Eliot, in his two very famous essays on Milton, wrote that Milton was a great artist with a bad influence. He was a great artist with a bad influence. Now, what is this bad influence? Something very important for us to know. What is this bad influence? Now, you know that Milton was trying to discover a new poetic idiom, a kind of poetic idiom which makes him absolutely different. It is the discovery of a personal idiom. When we read the when we assess the poets, how do we assess them? It is on the basis of the discovery of the idiom. A great poet discovers his own poetic idiom, whereas a minor poet can't. A minor poet imitates. A minor poet imitates. That's why if you, cons if you consider the I mean, critical theories and assessments, you'll find that some are classed as major poets and some are classed as minor poets. Why? Because they have been able to discover their own kind of idiom. Because, you know, on the point of subject, there cannot be any novelty. What are the subjects? You may talk about war, you may talk about history, you may talk about love, you may talk about despair, you may talk about merriment, you may talk about joy. Hundreds and hundreds of, I mean, topics are there like this. But these are all, these all have been already treated. So therefore, it is on the basis of the discovery of the poetic idiom that a poet is considered either a major poet or a minor poet. And T.S. Eliot calls him a great artist with a bad influence. Now, in fact, Eliot's assessment of bad influence refers to the new poetic idiom that Milton invents through auditory imagination and the grandeur of creative language. The creative language that he had devised through the discovery of polysyllabic Latinized formation. And it was an inimitable form of poetic idiom. In fact, Milton seemed to have exhausted the rich resources of poetic idiom for the next two, three generations. And for the succeeding centuries, his immense influence came to yield adverse result as the lesser poets continued to imitate him unsuccessfully. So that's why John Keats's Hyperion is a great example of that. And when Wordsworth's prelude wanted to go up to that scale but failed. So if you carefully <clears throat> consider the entire range of Milton criticism, we may discover as many as six different categories. I'm just giving you not all the six, but some of them. The first, uh, the first group of critical category of criti criticism 
refers to the doctrinal and theological analysis of Milton, which is defended by Professor C.S. Lewis, Professor E.M.W. Tilliard, Professor Douglas Bush, and others. They actually consider the impact of St. Thomas, sorry, St. Augustine's ideal of sin and fall as contained in the Civitas Dei, that means of the city of gods. So therefore the first is the influence of St. Augustine or the influence of St. Thomas Aquinas, that means the Augustinian influence, the Thomist influence, are particularly considered in terms of Milton's doctrinal protection of the poem. Tilliard, for instance, discusses the theme of obedience, which is called Lex Obedientalis, the doctrine of obedience, in the context of prelapsarian existence of man. Hanford makes an elaborate discussion on the cosmological and doctrinal content of the epic. In recent times, Benjamin Mears wrote a book called Milton's Theology of Freedom, published in 2012. Here he tries to study Milton against the background of post-reformation concept of theological freedom. So this is how we find that the first group of criticism First standpoint of criticism is essentially uh, second standpoint refers to the dramatic defense of Paradise Lost. Here I must unquote, he wrote an essay uh, the dramatic element in Paradise Lost, where Exam she examines the impact of Elizabethan drama on the theme and structure of the epic. Then again, Helen Gardner wrote a book called A Reading of Paradise Lost, and also wrote an essay called Milton, Satan, and the Theme of Damnation in Elizabethan Tragedy. They move away from the theological and doctrinal approaches to the epic. Therefore, Helen Gardner classifies Satan with Faustus and Macbeth as a tragic hero and celebrates the grand sweep of the Miltonic imagination. An elaborate analysis of dramatic elements of Milton's epic may be also found in such critics as Robert Elton Bailey's, then again M. Y. Hughes, and they are very definitely trying to, I mean, uh, try, trying to substantiate the dramatic elements in Paradise Lost. And uh, let me uh, quote a few lines from M. Y. C. Uh, essay, Epi Milton's epic, uh, sorry, Milton's Paradise Lost epic or drama. Here, Hewes says, it's a heightened kind of drama, which is too big for the stage and too rich for it in poetic perspectives around the conversations and debates that take up more than the narrative, do narrative does. Then we also may refer to some of the modern uh, theorists. For instance, I may refer to Stanley Fish. Um, it's a very interesting book. Uh, he wrote a book called Surprised by Sin, The Reader in Paradise Lost. It was published from Harvard University Press in 1998. He, in this book, he takes the issues with the rival camps represented by Lewis and Bush, interpreting, they are interpreting the doctrinal as aspects and all that. And then also there is a Waldock, Emson, they are trying to talk about the uh, application of new criticism theories. And Fish, Stanley Fish, therefore, tries to inflect on the reader response theory by positing the importance of the reader. So he says, Stanley Fish comments, Paradise, Paradise Lost is a poem about how its reader came to be the way they are. Its method is to provide in its readers wayward, fallen responses. So he is trying to make alive the reader in the poem. When the 
I mean, when the book is published in the form of a production, so naturally it's no longer the poet. It becomes the estate of the readers. The reader will now react to it in its own way. So that's why he says that such a great poem will ultimately provoke among the readers a different kind of response, multiple forms of responses. I would also refer to Sandayam Gilbert and Susan Gabbard's very famous book, The Mad Woman in the Attic, The Woman Writer and the 19th Century Literary Imagination, published by Yale University Press in 2000. Here, they are trying to give a feminist reading of the epic and questions the originary myth used by Milton. What is the originary myth that Milton establishes in conformity to the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve? But Eve was not the first woman. Actually, Eve was the second woman. In fact, if you look at the originary myths of the Bible, then God first created Lilith, the first wife of Adam, created like Adam, out of dust, not out of his bones, as in the case of Eve. And uh, as a result, Lilith also was as authoritative as Adam had been. And Adam did, did not therefore like her in many different ways. And as a result, the banishment and the punishment of Lilith. I'm quoting from Gilbert and Cooper. Because she considered herself his equal, she objected to lying beneath him so that when he tried to force her submission, she became enraged. You can consult this book and you will be able to get the whole story. So it is in this way that we find that, that Milton actually attracted attention from many different theorists and all of them trying to read Paradise Lost from a distinctive theoretical standpoint. So that actually shows the kind of popularity and attraction that the AP enjoys. I know that there is not much time and I'll not be able to complete uh, my lecture, but I will just give you some details on the invocation to Paradise Lost. If there is some time later, maybe next month, then I can give you the rest. But here today, let us do something about Milton's invocation to the muse. What is this invocation about? The impact and the influences and the <coughs> kinds of and the and the convention or tradition that have been that have, that have been used by Milton. Now Milton's invocation to the muse is more Virginian than Homeric. Elizabeth Minchin in her essay, the poet appeals to his muse, Homeric invocations in the context of epic performances, refers to four distinctive characteristics of Homeric invocations. Number one, invocation acts as an announcement. Number two, it acts as a signal for arresting the attention of the reader or audience. It establishes, number three, it establishes the poet's relation to the muse, which might help the poet to visualize the great event. And number four, the poet gives a prelude to the narrative content. So these are the four distinctive functions. Number one, invo invocation acting as announcement. Invocation acting as signal. Invocation establishing the relationship of, of the poet to the muse. I'm sorry, I have my power will go very soon. Let me just try to
Madam. I'm sorry for the interruption because uh, I have talked more than one hour, so therefore the power is low, the battery power is low, so I'll just make a quick um, assessment of the invocation to the muse. Now, these are the features, and these features underline the poet's basic preoccupation with presenting the narrative with the help of the muse as an in the muse as an in huh? Hello? Hello? Can you hear, you hear me? Yes, sir, you're yes, audible, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, okay. Thank you. So, uh, we therefore find I have I have discussed the four elements yes, sir. that we normally. Sir, your microphone has been muted, sir. So please unmute your microphone. Oh yes. Now can you hear me now? Yes. Sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, yes sir. sir. Now, as yes, I said, sir. I have referred to four distinctive functions of the invocation to the muse. Uh, that means, as an announcement, invocation acting as an announcement, invocation acting as a signal, invocation establishing the poet's relation to the muse, and here the poet gives a prelude to the narrative content. And it is this particular function, the muse acting as an informant. Where do we get it? If we read Homer's Iliad, the second book of Homer's Iliad, which is called Catalogue of the Ships, there you, you will come across the, the invocation to the muse as an informant. That's why the poet says, tell me, I cannot see, so give me this information. So this is how the muse acts as an informant. But in the Virgilian, So we can't see you or hear you. Sir, hello. Hello, sir. Sir, so we hello. can't hear you and see you. Hello. We are not I, able to see you, sir. I think his battery is gone. I think, Yes, I think his battery is exhausted and uh, he's trying to rejoin. Yes. Like he's there, but uh, we are. Please wait. Please wait. Yes, sir, yes, please wait. We can have patience. How much time it will take? Um, please wait. Um, we are going to contact him and ask him because obviously we are all remote. We are in, in fact, we are in different cities at this point. So um, as soon as he responds to us, we'll let you know.
हेलो 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 प्रोफेसर बस हेलो प्रोफेसर हां 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 प्रोफेसर बंद हां प्रोफेसर बंदोपाध्याय इज रीजॉइनिंग प्लीज वेट ही इज रीजॉइनिंग um yes in that case we'll just uh, wait for a few seconds till professor bondobatha rejoins yes sir shona jacche yes sir please go ahead yes sir yes sir acha sir yes sir so as i was uh, telling you that there are four distinctive elements and uh, we find that virgilian virgilian invocation adheres to some of the, uh, all of these points more or less but there is a very distinctive difference very distinctive difference between the homeric convention of invocation to the muse and the virgilian convocation to the epical muse virgilian invocation establishes a well defined ideology that's why in the very beginning of virgil's epic in it we find arma virum ke kano kano means i sing arma means arms virum ke of of, of man, arms and man i sing viru bhir means man of arms and man i sing this is my ideology i would in this epic uphold the principles of humanity and warfare that is the ideology but this kind of ideology is absolutely absent in the classical epics of homer homer's epic is absolutely secular it simply is a narrative of events but there is no intervention of ideology and milton follows the virgilian model virgilian model and virgil following virgil he wants to project an ideology what is that ideology to justify the ways of god to men that is his ideology and i will come back to this later on now milton divides his invocation into three parts if you consider the invocation of milton the first part is thema t h e m a thema which means central theme and number 2 is epiklese e p i k l e s e epiklese or invocation proper invocation and number 3 propositium propositium p r o p o s i t u m propositum meaning ideological purpose the proposal of an ideology so in milton's invocation we find a distinctive tripartite division number 1 is thema theme number 2 is epiklese or main body of invocation and number 3 propositum or ideological purpose in the first five lines the poet essentializes the central theme of the fall of the first man and the woman as the thematic content is deeply tinged with sadness and remorse because he's talking about the fall of man and woman naturally it is tinged with sadness and remorse and this is very distinctively not immanent in the predominance of strong consonants conducive to a sense of anxiety it creates a sense of anxiety read the lines of man's fast disobedience etc the emphasis on particular sounds emphasis on f emphasis on d and emphasis on t sounds that's why of first disobedience fruit forbidden tree mortal test brought death were unto world eden restore seat everywhere there is a sense of anxiety 
remorse and sadness. That's why the onomatopoetic effect on this sense of grief and bitterness. This precise indication to the central theme acts as the prologus, as the prologue to the grand thematic texture of the epic. So this is about the first five lines. Then in the succeeding movement, which is epiclesi or invocation, in the succeeding movement, line 6, 22, from 6 to 22, the poet begins his invocation to the muse. Homer's invocation to the muse seems confusing, insofar as he invokes a single muse, or on certain occasions, multiple muses, and there is no distinct reference to a name. Because, you know, in classical, theology, classical myths, mythology, in classical mythology, there are nine muses, and each has been assigned different kinds of purposes, different kinds of functions. And uh, that's why Homer, according to his own purpose, invokes different kinds of muses, because he has nine muses. That's why it sometimes seems confusing. Now, there is a critic called Gregory Negi. He has an article called A Reinvocation of the Muse for the Homeric Iliad. In this essay, he claims that the single muse is, as in Hesiod's Theogony, Hesiod actually was a contemporary of Homer, and he also wrote a book called The Theogony, right? The, the Origin of Gods. Now, he says, Gregory Negri says, that the particular muse which has been invoked by Homer in his Iliad is Calliope, C-A-L-L-I-O-P-E. Um, now, this Calliope is also present in Virgil. Virgil's muse in the in it is also Calliope, but, but Virgil also invokes other muses. That's why I will refer to an essay, um, F, an essay written by F. A. Todd. The title of the essay is Virgil's Invocation to Erato. Erato is the goddess of love. Virgil invokes Erato. Now, why does he do so? The muse of love in book seven. Why? Primarily because Virgil's epic ultimately turns to a triangular conflict in love involving Aeneas, Lavinia, and Turnus. So, as a result of this, he invokes, leaving aside Calliope, he invokes the God, muse of love, who is Erato. But it should be noted that none of these classical muses are heavenly or spiritual. They are essentially important as conducive to poetic inspiration which Plato described as enthusiasmos, frenzy, a creative frenzy, a creative madness, which leads to creative activity. But Milton, while adhering to the classical convention, develops a new creative form in his invocation to the muse. What does he do? The phrase heavenly muse has initiated multiple debates. It has been often argued that the muse is one of the trinities, right? The holy trinities, the holy ghost, and it is found to be compatible with the Jewish rabbinical sources that is always used by Milton, because he had a special training in that. Milton's anti-trinitarianism, because he was not a, not actually, he did not really accept the idea of the Trinities. That's why he is very often regarded as anti-Trinitarian. Now, Milton's anti-Trinitarianism evident in his very famous tract, De Doctrina Christiana. Right? De Doctrina Christiana. Now, here he, we find that he is not actually invoking the Holy Ghost. Milton constantly goes on specific terms loaded with scriptural resonances. He uses, for instance, note these terms, he uses secret, inspired, oracle, 
instruct, illumine, all of these are absolutely scriptural words. The invocation seems to be based on the esoteric doctrine of Illuminism. What is this Illuminism? It is very popular from the medieval till the 18th. Illuminism actually is the spiritual enlightenment. It is the state of mind which actually takes us upward and creates the illumination. So therefore, Milton again and again talks about that Illuminism. So what in the dark illumine? So he, that's why wants to illumine himself. It is not associated with creative frenzy or inspiration. Rather, Milton's emphasis lies on enlightenment that may be connected with Semitic sources. Semitic sources as also with Christian tradition. Semitic means the Hebraic tradition, the Old Testament tradition, to be very precise. As also with the Christian tradition, meaning the New Testament tradition. He, for that matter, identifies specific sites. What are the sites? Of Horeb or of Sinai. These are Old Testament Semitic tradition. So the sites of Horeb or Sinai, distinctly traceable to what? To the divine enlightenment of Moses. Moses went up to the top of Horeb or of Sinai in order to seek enlightenment. The God from the enlightened from the lighted bush inspired him and gave him the commands. So therefore, it is this illumination. That's why he uses the, the mounts of Horeb or of Sinai as a referential point. He also refers to Zion and Siloa. Now I can refer to another essay. This is written by Jackson I. Cope, C-O-P-E, Jackson I. Cope. The, the title of the essay is Milton's Muse in Paradise Lost. Here, he refers to Book of John, which describes child Christ's miracle of bringing back eyesight to the blind man and asking him to wash in the pool of Siloa. So therefore, you can see that the mosaic history or the miracles of Christ are all associated with the illumination. Take away my blindness. Give me the illumination. Illuminism, give me the enlightenment so that I can now once again defend my purpose, justify the ways of God to men. So that's why Milton actually tries to invoke the Spiritus Day. S P I R I T U S. I'm just spelling this for the students if there are any. Spiritus Day, D E I. Spiritus Day, Spirit of God. And Spiritus Sanctus, S P I R I T U S, Spiritus Sanctus, S A N C T U S. Sanctus means holy. Spiritus Sanctus meaning Holy Spirit. So he wants to invoke the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Holiness. In other words, Milton prays for the same enlightenment and the spiritual gifts as conferred on the ancient prophet Moses or even Christ himself. Milton, in Book 7 of Paradise Lost, particularly identifies the muse with Urania. You will, if you look at some of the lines of, I mean, Book 7, then you will find it there that he invokes Urania. Now, I'm reading some lines from Book 7. Descend from heaven's, I'm sorry, Descend from heaven, Urania, by that name, if rightly thou art called. The meaning, not the name, I call. For thou, nor of the muses nine, nor on the top of old Olympus, dwellest. So he is invoking Urania, but only the name, 
not its classical signification. In classical myth, Urania is the goddess of astronomy. Milton does not accept the classical association. He therefore explicitly says that he accepts only the meaning and not the name. I'm sorry, only the name. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, only the meaning and not the name. In Greek, I'm sorry, in Greek, Urania, what does it mean? Urania in Greek means heavenly. So only in the sense of heavenly, he takes it up. Therefore, we read in an essay written by Steffi Davis and William B. Hunter titled Milton's Urania, the meaning, not the name, I call. In this essay, Steffi Davis and William B. Hunter discard the classical origin of the name and thinks that Urania is a representation of the heavenly spirit helping the poet to accomplish, to accomplish the great task, the adventurous song, as he says. This is the adventurous song. As Milton long, long back called it the great work, magnum opus, that's why the adventurous song. Ideology forms no part of the classical epics of Homer, but the teleological and historic vision of Virgil's in it distinctively identifies a distinctive purpose. In the Virgilian analysis, in it is meant to be an institutionalized epic. What does that mean? An epic that upholds, celebrates an institution. In Virgil's case, it was Rome. It was Rome that actually he wanted to celebrate, which portrays Aeneas's vocational journey leading to the celebration of the Roman Empire. In the very beginning of his epic, he specifically says, Arma virumke carno, of arms and man, I say. Milton's avowed assertion at the end of the invocation distinctly underlines the poet's ideological purpose. What does he say? That to the height of this great argument, I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. If the epic is meant for a religious Christian audience in the 17th century, why should Milton have to shoulder the responsibility of initiating a debate on eternal providence. I'm sorry. As also of justifying the ways of God to men. Why does he at all have to justify the ways of God to men? Does he need to justify the ways of God to men? Because he what is there that we should try to challenge the idea of God as far as we are a Christian audience? If it is meant for a Christian audience, is there any necessity for justifying the ways of God to men? So, the answer to these questions, the answer to these questions brings us to a consideration of 17th century debate on the nature and origin of evil. What is the cause of evil? Who has created the evil? And what is God's role in this? In an age of Cartesian dualism, Cartesian actually is an adjective of the name of the philosopher, 17th century um, <coughs> French philosopher, Car uh, I mean Descartes. D-S-C-A-R-T-E-S, from that Cartesian, Cartesian dualism, that means mind and matter, that kind of dualism. <clears throat> In an age of Cartesian dualism, the rise of scientific philosophy and the emergence of a rational elitist class, the popular and traditional belief in the nature of good and evil and the consequent fall of man began to be questioned. They began to question such absolutist ideas uh, because they had been 
they have already discovered the idea of reason. They are now believers in scientific philosophy. Why should they be sold on such ideas that we are, we have fallen because of the evil? What is the proof? Where do, where do we can where can we get the proof for that? The I'll refer to the Dutch scholar, the Dutch scholar Balthasar Becker, for instance, at that time began to develop an organized debate on the sense of evil. The 17th century rationalists and theologians began to argue that the cosmology being imperfect posits a coexistence of good and evil. And it is therefore impossible to avoid the shadow of evil which the omnipotent God could only eradicate. Now God is all-powerful, omnipotent. God has everything, God is all-seeing. He knows, he has said in book three, book second, sorry, in the second book, that yes, I know that one day Satan will enter the Garden of Eden and destroy the first man and the first woman. So he is omnipotent, all-seeing, but he doesn't do anything to destroy evil. This is the question that is coming up. The, the central issue had been the inconsistency of a benevolent all-knowing and omnipotent God with the existence of evil world, with the existence of evil in the world that God has created. So God has created this world. So why should not God try to destroy evil and allow the first man and woman to fall? The debate continuing beyond the 17th century would be also noticed in the works of Archbishop William, Archbishop William King's The Origin of Mali or Leibniz's book Theodicy. In fact, religious and philosophical controversies related to rival claims made by Calvinism, Arminianism, Cartesianism, many kinds of religious sects actually have been vying with each other in order to find out the justification of God. Is God really just? Why should God, why should not God take the responsibility of eradicating evil from the world? If he had done that, then Adam and Eve would never have fallen from the paradise. So this actually is the reason that Milton takes upon himself to try to justify the ways of God to men. That means he, in the invocation, has a distinctive purpose. And what is the purpose? The purpose is to try to resolve the controversial epic, controversial issue in his epic and vindicate the role of the omnipotent God in terms of evil and human suffering. The issues that he had raised in De Doctrina comes to be affirmed through the epical framework of Paradise Lost. So that's why this is all I have to say about the invocation to the muse. But this is only the beginning because I think that I should talk about the role of Satan, the idea of hell, the epical qualities, especially the epic symbolism, which is absolutely very different from the traditional way that we try to interpret it. But I feel that if I get another chance, another opportunity, then I'll be able to share my views with it. This is just a very summary presentation of what I think about Milton. That's why I talked about I talked about my <clears throat> uh, assessment of the social, political, and religious uh, controversies and the troublesome reigns of. Uh, James I, King Charles I, and then uncertain years of the uh, Commonwealth government, and then the further uh, troublesome reign of Charles II, but the reformation came. But at the same time, while the political social scenario had been so disturbed and turbulent, we find a wonderful, I mean, emergence of rationality and intellectualism in this in this early modern period. 
So therefore, it is because of this new philosophy, the rise of the new philosophy and new science, that it comes to be considered the early modern period. And uh, against this background, I have tried to study Milton. I have um, discussed Milton in terms of three distinctive, four distinctive, I mean, categories. Number one, the formative years, where I have considered the influences on Milton, uh, the influence of his father, the family, and influence of his uh, masters, teachers, and his friends, and then his uh, Horton period, where he composed some six poems, and then his Italian journey, where he had the opportunity to meet many of the great masters of the time, and then the political Milton, a uh, fruitful time for him, because he, not poetically, but politically, and then final years, the poetical Milton emerging, and we find Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, and Samson Agonistus. The emergence of a great poet and the accomplishment of the task, the great work, the great poem. And after that, I have tried to discuss the only the invocation, many different aspects of invocation. Actually, we should try to read invocation in its proper perspective, then it will give us a proper. Um, angle to study the invocation. But in future, if I have any opportunity, then I will share my thoughts with you regarding the epical qualities, the structure, as well as uh, the hell, the, uh, the presentation of hell, the portrayal of Satan, along with the other fallen angels, and the distinctive ideological framework, which is very important. Otherwise, we cannot interpret the rest of the epic. Uh, so that will be done at a later period. But well, thank you very, very much for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share my thoughts with you. I know whatever whatever little I had, uh, I, I could know about Milton. And I shared those things with you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. So I conclude. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Bondogadhyay, for uh, a rather detailed uh, discussion of the matter. Um, uh, on a personal note, before we move to questions, I must say that Milton always intrigues me uh, because I was, I've been lucky enough to be taught by Professor Omnandaj Gupta, one of the greatest living Miltonists today. So uh, there are many points that I'd like to talk about, but obviously our audience must be given uh, priority. Um, so. For anyone who wishes to ask questions, please type them in. I will read them out. And uh, Professor Bandhubathai, I hope we'll not have a problem answering them. Hello. Hello. Yes. I'm Dr. Shishupal from Himachal Pradesh. Yes. I'm serving I as an assistant. Yeah, I have already uh, given a question to you, sir, in a chat. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. I, I, can, I can see the chat. Yes, actually, sir, I have. I can't see it either. Could you retype it or? Uh, uh, okay, I'll just. Uh, okay, um, my question to Dave, sir, can Paradise Lost be regarded as a work of theology and cosmology, and as a work of an identity of our origin? Okay, this is a question. Actually, can, can I have. I have already try to answer this question in terms of my lecture you have said that can it be read as theology his uh, i mean uh, discussion on theology an epic of theology and cosmology Cosm and the origin of and, man yeah yeah and the origin identity of, man. of our origin yeah yes actually you know there are different kinds of standpoints there are different kinds of critical positions if you look at the earlier points of uh, earlier critical positions of EMW Tilliard or C.S. Lewis or even Professor J. A. Hanford, then you will see that they are trying to consider Milton as a doctrinal thesis. They are trying to consider this as a doctrinal thesis. And as a result, they are limiting themselves to the ideals of St. Augustine or St. Thomas Aquinas 
and other scholastic philosophers, even to some extent the English scholastic philosopher Ramus. But you know that there are multiple ways nowadays to discuss and consider and interpret Milton. So that's a, yes, of course, it is one of the ways that we may look at it. That's why I say that Milton had a purpose in vacation. He says that he wants to justify the ways of God to men. But well, why did he do so? This is a question that we don't really ask. Was it, then, was it really necessary to justify the ways of God to men? Because he was writing it for a Christian audience. And they are completely aware of what Christian tradition means for them and the role of God. But there had been a debate. And that this debate actually cropped up because of this contention. Because of this contention, because on the one hand, the rise of the cultivated intellectual society, as well as that there have been the last remains, the last traces of scholastic philosophy. So that's why it actually created a tension. Because uh, the cultivated society would not really be accepting, accepting those age-old ideas that God has created both. And I remember that one of the critics said that, well, the Elizabethan world order wanted to create a world of plenitude, the variety, the Lucretian ideal of copiousness, variety. So therefore, it is every, every, everything is there. In this mirroring of the world, you can see all of this. You can see good, you can see evil. So that's why it is your choice, which I'll be discussing later on uh, if I get an opportunity, because Milton uh, is following, as you have asked the question, the doctrinal side. Let me just explain. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas had been a very great influence on Milton. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas, and Milton also discusses it in De Christina, a uh, De Doctrina. Uh, here, Milton says that, well, what is it that actually makes the creation of a perfection, a creation of perfection. He says that God has created man. God has created the angels. God has created everything. Now, he, according to Thomas' analysis, that means the analysis of St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, we find that on the one hand, there is lex obedientalis. That means the doctrine of obedience. You have to be obedient to God. So God created this world and said that they should not eat the fruits of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So that is obedience. And in, in the case of Satan, there are the angelic forms, the nine circular angelic forms, and everyone is held together by means of the norms of superiority. So everyone must obey his natural superior. So that is lex obedientalis, doctrine of obedience. But on the other hand, there is, as pointed out by St. Thomas, recta ratio, the right reason, which will make the choice. Which will make the choice. So therefore, God has said that you don't eat those fruits, etc. But it is your own rational choice. That will de determine what you will do. Would you, would you eat the fruit or not? That is your right reason. So it is here that the sense of choice comes in. It is the sense of choice. That's why in the Elizabethan drama, for instance, you find always the contrast between the intellective will and the appetite will. If you look at Macbeth, for instance, consider the dagger scene. There is a distinctive interplay between the intellective will and the appetitive will. The appetitive will is the will of desire, the personal desire, and the intellective will is the will of intellect. So similarly here, we find that there is 
lex obedientalis, the doctrine of obedience, and on the other hand, the uh, rectoratio, the right reason. So that's why in Christian doctrine, in Christian analysis, ultimately tragedy became a matter of choice. In classical drama, for instance, King Oedipus, they have no choice. It's thrust upon them. King Oedipus can't stand against it. Agamemnon cannot stand against it because it's already prefixed, predestined. But it is not predestined. The idea of destiny comes to have a new connotation. The idea of choice comes to have a new connotation. It is in this way that we can read Paradise Lost. It is, of course, doctrinal, theological, regarding the originary aspects of man, all of this, but at the same time, there are scopes for multiple variants of interpretation. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Anything else? Thank you, sir. There is one more type question uh, from... Um, well, it's, it's the, the question has slipped my mind, but the question was, why has uh, Milton made Satan the hero uh, in, in Paradise Lost? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, Satan is not the hero. Uh, this is a very age-old uh, creation created by William Blake. Oh, Milton no, belongs to the Devil's Party without knowing it. A very famous cliche kind of statement, but Milton actually did not belong to the Devil's Party. In fact, Milton in his epic, if you consider the total framework from book one till the last book, then you will find that there is a distinctively progressive degeneration in the character of Satan. Right. He if we are just sold on the idea of Satan in book one, then we'll find that, well, Satan is trying to, I mean, make himself appear to be heroic. Looks like that. But actually, Satan actually is here in transit. Satan thinks. Satan thinks here is in transit. So that's why he is now the fallen angel. And from the fallen angel, he will the escapee convict. So that's why he flies away from that. In book four, he emerges as the thief entering the garden. And then finally, he will crawl like a serpent and then get the punishment. So that's why I'm not really sold on this idea that Satan is the hell hero. In fact, you know, sir, uh, Helen Gardner, of course, consider there are heroic elements of course there are heroic elements because you must remember that his adversary who are his ad adversaries his adversary is god so that's a that's why rabono also looks heroic because he has to fight ram so that's why satan also has to be heroic because he is fighting against god thank you thank you uh, thank you, sir. Would you? There is one, just one more question. I will allow uh, because it's been typed a long time ago. Um, yes. It is by Abhijit Singh, and he asks. So, um, since Philip Pullman is uh, inspired by Milton in his uh, to write the Dark Materials trilogy, how what? Uh, how do you see the connection between the two? Uh, I don't understand. What is that? So the so Philip Pullman is a modern fantasy writer. Who wrote a trilogy called the Dark Materials trilogy? The first one you may have heard of because it was turned into a film called The Golden Compass. So in no, it, he me, uses the theme of Paradise not, Lost. So let me, um, that, let me tell you that uh, I have no idea about that. I see. So that's why, right, Mr. Singh. Not, I hope that. Uh, yes, yes. I have so, no Mr. Idea. Singh, you have I your have answer. No knowledge of that. Yes. If there is anything relating to Milton, then I can answer. Yes. Um, no, thank you very much uh, for, gives, for giving us this time and um, before uh, and thank you for answering the questions as well. Uh, we now formally declare the question answer session closed.
Um, I will now invite my colleague Shubhendu Bishash to deliver the vote of thanks for this lecture. Uh, just before that, one small announcement. On, because we are learning about technology to, for tomorrow's event, which will feature Dr. Shorab Nag, uh, the event will open at 10.30 so that uh, people can get into the queue and by 11.30 we should all be in. Uh, this will this will prevent us from the from from the small delay that happened today morning. So uh, I think from 10:30, 10:35, you can start asking to join the meeting. Um, so uh, that is the house only housekeeping announcement I have. And uh, may I now invite my colleague, uh, Mr. Shubhendu Vishash, to please deliver the vote of thanks. Shubhendu, are you there? Yes, uh, Juventu, you have unmuted yourself. Please go ahead. Here, I am here. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes you yes, are sir. audible. Yes. Hello. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Basu. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Professor Vandavadai for such an engaging academic session. Uh, the present task of thanking falls on me. Uh, it's really a matter of great privilege for me. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Shamal Shatra, the president of the governing body of the college, uh, for his encouragement of this event. I thank Professor Bondavadai, Vice Chancellor of Bankura University, for so kindly agreeing to deliver the inaugural lecture in the series and enriching us with his knowledge. Uh, many thanks also due to Dr. Shatna Gurui, the principal of this institution, who has kindly agreed to uh, deliver uh, his inaugural uh, lecture and also providing us with all sorts of assistance. While I would also like to thanks to all the colleagues of our department for in, uh, organizing this event. I would also thank Professor Dr. Narendranjan Maloch for organizing this event and also for encouraging all of the uh, students to participate. Uh, last but not the least, I would also thank all the technical assistants. I would also like to thank all the members of the audience, like all the professors of various colleges and universities, of uh, the scholars and also the students for engaging in this session. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will meet tomorrow at 11.30, though the event will open for joining from about 10.30 onwards. Uh, this session is now ended. Thank you very much. Thank you.